Information Day. Uh, welcome to the HKU Virtual Information Day mock lecture, um, and I'm happy to welcome you. My name is Jessica Valdez. I'm an associate professor at the School of English, and I'll be leading a mock lecture today called Reading Like a Detective. Basically, my goal here is to introduce you to the kinds of skills uh, that you'll learn as a student in the English literature classroom in the School of English at the University of Hong Kong. At times, I will invite you to participate in the class and you're welcome to do so. Um, I believe that you can do that through the chat function. So basically a chat to the entire group called everyone, um, or you're welcome to kind of participate out loud if you prefer to do that as well. Um, also, it looks like there's a Q&A option available as well. So if you have any questions as we go along, you're welcome to ask. Um, and also at the end, I'll try to save some time for some questions. So first of all, I'd like to ask you a general question. Uh, what are your favorite detective stories, films, or shows? You can just list them in the chat function um, on Zoom and on the webinar. I'll give a moment to, to hear what you have to say. And as you're listing your favorite detective stories, films, or shows, I'll say a little bit about why I'm opening this way. The reason why is because the work of the uh, student in the English literature classroom is a little bit like a detective. Right? So a detective has to do the work of analyzing a crime scene, of analyzing the clues to come to a conclusion. And in a way, that's sort of what we do in the English literature classroom. So I see we have a couple of um, comments and responses. We have anything by Agatha Christie, um, Sherlock Holmes, Dan Brown, uh, Lupin. Uh, so uh, an assortment of responses. Yeah, and Sherlock Holmes, of course, is so, is so famous now, partly because of the recent, or not recent anymore, but not too distant, remake of Sherlock Holmes in the BBC version called Sherlock, which I know is quite popular as well. Oh, Scooby-Doo, that's another good example, and Nancy Drew as well. There's so many different detective stories that we're familiar with throughout um, cultures and across cultures. Um, so let me say a little bit about, a little more about why I've selected this as the focus for today's lecture. I mean, as I said, we're a little bit like a detective uh, when we are in the literature classroom. And while we're not looking for, a, we're not looking at a crime scene, we're not trying to come to a conclusion about a crime and who did it, we are analyzing and thinking about uh, how a text works. And that text could be a novel, it could be a short story, it could be an essay. It may not even be a text. It might be a film, it might be a TV show, it could be a graphic novel. There's lots of different kinds of works that we look at. And basically what we'll do is we'll look at clues to come to a conclusion or our own interpretation of what is going on in the work that we're analyzing. So now I want to ask you about the method that detectives use when they're analyzing a crime scene or when they're analyzing clues. In a detective story, how does a detective examine the crime scene and what clues do they look for? And again, I want to invite you to give some answers in the chat box. So what kind of clues do they look for at a crime scene? Um, this might vary based on whether you're thinking of a contemporary detective story or an older detective story. Fingerprints, yes, that is the first one we think about. Um, so they're looking to see if there are any fingerprints that they can identify that will then signify who was at the crime scene. Footprints, yes, yeah, so any damage that's been done to this to whatever's around the scene. Hair samples windows, clothes. Um, one person says they look for small things, I guess. Blood, DNA, signs of a fight, markings, weapons, items that are relevant to the case. And they also look for witnesses. Anything that looks out of place, says Lorraine. These are great points. So they're looking really for details that will help them put together an interpretation of what might have happened at that crime scene. 
And so basically a detective story is about a detective, about a reader basically, who is looking at clues to come to a conclusion about what happened in the past, to come to a conclusion about what story was basically enacted before the crime uh, was discovered. They're trying to find out who the murderer is or who the criminal is and how that crime was carried out. And details include like uh, fingerprints that will tell them who the potential um, criminal is, footprints again, uh, hair samples, DNA and more recent uh, stories, DNA because it's using technology uh, to help them come to a conclusion about who the identity of the person is. And I have a little um, a cartoon here, an older cartoon that basically says what you've just identified so effectively. Um, in Sherlock Holmes' day, uh, there were no modern detective tools such as fingerprinting to solve crimes. Uh, so Holmes used his deductive powers to catch criminals. He measured shoe tracks or footprints, noted, noticing the length of stride between prints so he could figure out how tall a person was. Um, he was also able to tell like how a person walked based on their footprints. He looked for things like discarded cigars, as well as typewriters and handwriting to help figure out who the person would be. I mean, here we have sort of an iconic image of Sherlock Holmes looking through um, a, a, um, a microscope at uh, the, the, a puzzle piece, what essentially looks like a puzzle piece to figure out what happened. Okay, so as I said, in the English literature classroom, like a detective, you will analyze texts and works of literature to develop your own interpretation of how, or a theory of how the text works. And this is how I teach it in a course that I teach called Crime Stories. We actually look at Sherlock Holmes stories as well as early other early detective stories. We read Agatha, Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express, um, as well as a recent Hong Kong novel uh, that help us to think about detective stories, but also about the work that we're doing as readers. Now, of course, our tools are a little bit different than the tools of a detective. We're not using fingerprinting or DNA like modern detectives might use. Um, we are looking at things like word choice. And this is what we call close reading. When you choose a short section of a text, like a passage, and analyze the details and structure and the ways that it's written. So some of the tools that we have um, include things like word choice. What words is the author using? Uh, style, is there a particular style to the passage? Sentence structure, literary techniques like imagery, metaphors, and, and other components that go into the creation of a text. And we don't just look at small sections. Uh, we don't just focus, uh, like say on a fingerprint. We also look broadly in the way that a detective also thinks about all the clues that he's seen or she has seen. So in wider textual analysis, we might think about the structure of the whole poem, the short story, the novel, or whatever text we're looking at. Questions like, is the story going in chronological order? What's the narrative perspective? And these things can help us come to our own understanding of how that text works and to answer questions that we might have. So here is an excerpt or a passage as we call it from the first Sherlock Holmes story called A Study in Scarlet. Basically what happens in this very short novella is a man has been killed in London and Watson has just met Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is the famous detective and Watson is essentially his sidekick, but they've just met and Watson, Watson has accompanied uh, Holmes on this investigation. Um, Holmes has gone to a house where the body has been left and he's looking at the crime scene. If you've seen recent adaptations of this in the show Sherlock, this is actually a lot like a study in pink. So you can kind of envision that, that first episode when you're thinking about this excerpt. So I'm gonna read it out loud and then I want you to answer this question in the chat 
what are Watson's impressions of Holmes? In answering this question, think about the details in the, quota in the quotation. What do they tell you about what Watson thinks of Holmes, and especially of Holmes as a detective? So I'll read it slowly so you can follow carefully. As he spoke, and just to remind you, this is Watson's perspective. He is the person who is the speaker. As he spoke, he whipped a tape measure and a large round magnifying glass from his pocket. With these two implements, he trotted noiselessly about the room, sometimes stopping, occasionally kneeling, and once lying flat upon his face. So engrossed was he with his occupation that he appeared to have forgotten our presence, for he chattered away to himself under his breath the whole time, keeping up a running fire of exclamations, groans, whistles, and little cries suggestive of encouragement and of hope. As I watched him, I was irresistibly reminded of a pure-blooded, well-trained foxhound as it dashes backwards and forwards through the covert whining in its eagerness until it comes across the lost scent. For 20 minutes or more, he continued his researches, measuring with the most exact care the distance between marks which were entirely invisible to me and occasionally applying his tape to the walls in an equally incomprehensible manner. In one place, he gathered up very carefully a little pile of gray dust from the floor and packed it away in an envelope. Finally, he examined with his glass the word upon the wall, going over every letter of it with the most minute exactness. This done, he appeared to be satisfied, for he replaced his tape and his glass in his pocket. Okay, so that is the quotation. I mean, I want to see what you think of it. Uh, what are Watson's impressions of Holmes here? Uh, how does he describe Holmes as a detective? And you can write your thoughts in the chat and they can be, you know, a couple of words. You can write full sentences. It's entirely up to you how you want to participate. Cherry says he thinks he's unusual. Jane says he's devoted. Mm. He thinks he is professional, detail-minded, intelligent, mis intelligent, mysterious, enthusiastic, professional and passionate is about his job, focused. Yeah, that seems key. What, Lorraine says that Watson is fascinated by Holmes. I think that's a key point. We get a sense of Watson's attitude and feeling here towards Holmes through the language he's using. Um, Lawrence says he admires his devotion to his work and professionalism. Lyric says Holmes is very observant and focuses on minor details. Minute exactness shows his precision. Really, really excellent point. So Holmes is incredibly um, careful in his observation and he's able to see minor details that someone like Watson would not notice. Ruby adds to that, that he's meticulous. Um, and, and Liz says that he's a well-trained foxhound and that sense it's almost animalistic. Okay, so Liz, uh, Liz Ho, Dr. Ho has already suggested a direction that I might go in now. All of you have given really wonderful kind of descriptions of, um, or adjectives of Watson's uh, perspective of Holmes. Now tell me what words in the excerpt made you think that Watson admires Holmes? What specific details or words leads you to think that that Watson thinks that Holmes is meticulous, is dedicated, is professional, is detail-oriented. Are there any words that stand out to you or any details? And the one example that Dr. Ho gives is well-trained foxhound. What do you think of that phrase in particular? Hazel notes that this characterizes Holmes as incomprehensible. Okay, so I'm gonna note a couple of examples. Uh, Louisa points out irresistibly reminded of, which were entirely invisible to me. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna point out just a few things in the passage that might help you think more in more detail about how Watson is talking about Holmes. Um, the first example, uh, the, the cursor has disappeared. Just a moment, let me get it back. Uh, 
Okay. Great. Okay. Yes, it's working. Oh, and I went to the wrong page. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just a moment. Okay. Now we've got it. Okay, so I want to note a few words. Uh, first of all, Dr. Ho pointed out the pure blooded, well trained foxhound. So, and, and also that Watson was irresist irresistibly reminded of this. That's interesting that, that in his work, I mean, you all pointed out that Holmes is professional, um, that he's a, he's a professional person. And yet he's Watson is reminded of a foxhound, a well-trained foxhound. So in this way, he's representing uh, Holmes almost as sort of animalistic, as someone who is so focused on their work and so well-trained that they're not even thinking about what they're doing. Um, and it gives you a sort of nice image too of the, the way, the process that Holmes is working and dashing back and forth, sort of focused on the work that he's doing, very much like a foxhound, like a dog kind of focused on the chase, focused on catching the fox. Some other things that we can notice as well are words like um, he whipped a tape measure, kind of pulling out a tape measure quickly and a large magnifying glass from his pocket. He trotted noiselessly. Yes, Hazel just pointed that out, trotted. Also words like groans and whistles, little cries. So here he no longer actually seems, I mean, on one level he seems professional, but another level it's almost like this sort of unthinking animalistic impulse or, trained behavior in the way that he's analyzing the crime scene. And there's also a, an amount of pleasure in it, sort of like a enjoyment, whistles, little cries, suggestive of encouragement and hope. And earlier, um, yes, Lawrence says it's almost as if it comes to him naturally at this point, like he doesn't even have to think about it in the same way that we breathe or in the same way that someone might say, go running. Um, for 20 minutes or more. So we get a sense of exactly how long this is. He continued his researches. And then we shift a little bit, measuring with the most exact care, the distance between marks, which were entirely uh, invisible to me. So we get now no longer the sort of foxhound, but the careful meticulous measurement of marks that Watson himself cannot see. Um, and then finally at the end, uh, he examined with his glass the word upon the wall, going over every letter of it with the most, most minute exactness, this kind of sense of care and precision. So we get a lot of detail here from the, de from the, the language, the word choice, um, the, the um, comparison of Holmes to a dog, to a foxhound, the language that almost represents him like an animal, but also like a well-trained, um, person who is doing work that they do regularly. There's a lot of information that we get here. And the reason why I wanted to do this is to give you a sense of the, the ways that we also can examine a text uh, with care, with attention, by looking at details in the way that in this scene, um, Holmes himself is analyzing the scene. Um, and basically what happens in detective stories is that even though they are about, and they seem to be about a detective who is examining uh, a crime scene and trying to find out who has committed the murder, they're also kind of about the act of reading. They're about how we attribute meaning and interpret meaning in a work of art or in a text um, as we are readers, because we are reading like Holmes is reading as well. So let me go to the next slide. And my screen just froze again. Just a moment. There we go. Okay. Okay. And let me clear the page. Okay. So this gives you, again, as I said, a sampling of what a close reading might look like in class, the kind of discussion we might have. And often we deal with a range of topics and themes in English literary studies. And I wanna give you a sense of some of the kind of analysis and discussions we have in class. 
Now your courses will vary, of course, uh, but they may deal with the following topics or issues. So issues of gender, race, class, and sexuality, issues of colonialism, imperialism, and or post-colonialism, particularly issues of form and aesthetics, by which I mean partly the, the experience of art, and this it includes analyzing different kinds of art, different forms, including poetry, novels, short stories, film, graphic novels, um, and other forms of writing and cultural production. Uh, we might also look at how historical context, what happened in history might shape and produce a work of literature or popular culture, as well as uh, bridging both literature, like what we see as canonical or what was recognized as literature, like say Shakespeare or Charles Dickens, but also popular culture. So I've shown in this class called Crime Stories, uh, the first episode of Sherlock called A Study in Pink. Now, I wanna go broad again and ask why study literature? There's lots of answers. And I think that you will get different responses from different teachers and different students. But I want to give you a few possible answers here. Um, first of all, you will develop the skills to be a more insightful and critical reader of the world around you. You'll also strengthen, and this is from a more career perspective, you'll strengthen your communication skills in writing, reading, speaking, and listening. You'll get lots of practice, reading works, different kinds of works, and speaking in class, also listening to each other, and finally in writing different kinds of genres. As I just said, you'll learn to write for different kinds of audiences and also different genres, by which I mean different kinds of writing. So you will write lots of academic essays, yay. Um, but not just academic essays, there's actually other different kinds of assignments that we give in our classes. And those include like websites, you might be asked to create a website or a part of a website, or I just asked my students to create a podcast or a museum guide comparing two different objects across two different museums. Or you might say, write a short story. There's lots of different kinds of assignments that you might be exposed to in our classrooms. And these prepare you to go on after university and write different ways, depending on the kind of employment or work you do. You'll also read literature from many places and times, as I said, from Shakespeare to Charles Dickens, as well as to Hong Kong literature and contemporary novels as well. So you, you really get a wide experience um, and you also have some autonomy and responsibility in choosing what you want to study. So if you do want to focus primarily, say, on Hong Kong literature, you can take Dr. Ho's classes. But if you want to take, say, Shakespeare, you would take Dr. Luke's classes. We have quite a wide array of material uh, that allows you to kind of cater or, or sort of um, decide what you want your, your work to look like. Um, also, although this is debated, some studies have shown that readers of literature learn to feel more sympathy for other people. So arguably, uh, depending on the work that you're reading, but perhaps if you're reading novels, you might have a better sense or it challenges you to think about how other people feel and how other people experience the world. So you can be a more kind of thoughtful person uh, outside the classroom as well. So that is all I want to say today. It's actually quite a short uh, period of time. At this point, I want to open it up to any questions. Um, according to my clock, we have about five minutes left. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have either about Sherlock Holmes or about the uh, literature classroom um, in general. And you can ask questions on the chat. I'm not sure because it's a webinar if you're able to ask in person, I don't think you can. Um, so do feel free to ask me questions in the chat. Yes, Dr. Ho says there's no audio. So I'm just speaking to a computer, but I'll imagine you all there. Um, but do let me know if you have questions in the chat. And if not, um, I think you can go and come back for the uh, other mock lecture from ling linguistics if you like.
Yes, and, and as Dr. Ho says, please feel free to email us with your questions and I'll send you my email in case you'd like to get in touch with me. And again, my name is Jessica Valdez. I'm an associate professor of English in the University of Hong Kong. Um, and I'm happy to any, any, answer any questions you might have about the kind of work that we do in, in literature. And I think audio is just allowed. So if you'd like to ask me out loud, you're welcome to do that as well. Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions. So I just wanna say thank you everyone. Oh wait, okay, Louisa says, I'm actually more interested in creative writing than analyzing literature. Would you recommend that I study literature or something else? That's actually a really good question. Um, Dr. Ho can speak to this more specifically because she knows our course offerings, but we do have classes in creative writing and some of our classes do offer the option to do a creative writing assignment. I believe quite strongly that analyzing literature will also help you be a stronger creative writer because that way you're engaging with the history of creative writing. You're reading works that have been written in the past. Um, and so then you have a better sense of where you fit in as your own writer. So I would encourage you to do both, to, to both study literature and also write creatively. Um, so yes, I would say that it is the right. Hi, thank you, Jessica, for your wonderful presentation and welcome also those of you um, here to uh, virtually to, to the School of English at Hong Kong U. Um, I would echo uh, Dr. Valdez and say that you um, would be able to study both creative writing and literature. Um, and we strongly encourage you to do that. We offer classes in creative writing um, through the School of English. You are absolutely, uh, this is an answer to Cherry's question, you can absolutely minor in English literature while studying um, another major in a different department. Um, you can also double major in English Lit um, or in English Studies as well as uh, major in another, um, in another department. Um, all of your, this is an answer to uh, Zheng Hao, all of your um, classes that you take within the School of English will have um, what we call different literary periods. So Dr. Valdez, for example, is an expert in the 19th century, um, and I am an expert in contemporary literature. Um, other colleagues are experts in Shakespeare, so you will be able to choose from a different kind of literary period, very similar to the School of Chinese. Um, yeah, go ahead. You'll, you'll also get history in these classes. I mean, literature is sort of, in, as I said, you'll learn historical context. So yes, you will learn some, some history of the, the context that the literature was written in or created in. Um, so there will be that component as well. Uh, there is no interview in terms of applying for the course, but uh, this is an answer to Hannah's question. However, um, there are uh, strict um, performance sort of uh, assessment levels that you need in order to major in English literature. So, for example, you need to have um, a level five DSE if you're a Hong Kong student. Um, and if you are not a Hong Kong student, if you've studied IB or literature, um, for example, um, you would need to submit your scores to the School of English in order to um, figure out what the equivalency would be. Uh, Kathy, yes, you can have a completely different major from a different field and combine it with English studies. Uh, different jobs available with the English literature degree. Um, I think Dr. Valdez would agree with me that English studies majors could do just about anything after they graduate with a degree in English studies. Um, we've had students go on to um, postgraduate work, um, not only in English, but in different fields, such as law, uh, as law social work, psychology, um, but also uh, throughout Hong Kong, any kind of, or overseas, any kind of, um, uh, any kind of job you can think of, um, English studies provides you with the reading, writing, and research skills that are transferable to just about any career. 
Yeah, and we've, we've also, we have an internship program for final year students and students have done internships that range from advertising to HR work uh, to the obvious expectation of teaching. So there's like, a, there's a wide range of the kind of work that our students both intern in, but also do when they graduate. And actually, let me answer, I see there's a question in the Q&A, uh, a, a general question. If literature focuses on words instead of films, do you think that books are always better than films? Um, no, I don't think that books are always better than films. They're, they're just different uh, forms of art and are worth study in their own right. And I think the class that you take uh, will determine whether you're studying only like text or, or uh, books as you call it, or, and also film, but often your classes probably will not just focus on books, but also incorporate say some film or uh, more, uh, more, <clears throat> more mixed forms like graphic novels. So there is not one that's more, that's superior to, superior to the other. And will it be studied, difficult to study English literature here without taking English literature in secondary school? So my answer would be that you will take introductory courses first uh, before you begin to take more advanced courses. So in those introductory courses, you learn a foundation for your, the skills that you will need later on. So I think even if you haven't had that experience at the secondary level, you can develop those skills in the introductory courses. It might be a bit more difficult because it will be new to you, whereas you will be around some students who have some experience, but that's okay. And you are encouraged to reach out to the teacher for additional help and of course to learn from your fellow students. And a Dr. Ho has answered that as well. Yes, our introductory courses are specifically geared to those who have no experience in secondary school. Um, and many students I've taught have not had experience beforehand studying literature and they've done very well. In fact, one I've taught for several years and she's now in one of my advanced courses and is one of my best students. Promise that studying literature will be fun. Well, it, it can be <laughs> fun, but it can also be really difficult. So it's fun and difficult. Um, yeah, you'll have mi mixed feelings at various times, like with anything, but I think it's fun. All of your professors are also will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have to end now. We've been told to leave or I've been told to leave. So it was nice to kind of meet all of you. And uh, I hope that you'll all come next year and join our school. It's a wonderful place to be. All right, bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.